Friends, welcome newcomers. My name is Rico Cruz. I'm a grateful recovered alcoholic. Blessed to be here by the grace of a very loving and caring God who's kept me clean and sober in spite of myself. I'm also grateful for the men and women that I've met in these rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous who thankfully cared about me till I learned how to care about myself. And that included in sobriety too. I said I cared, but I acted like I didn't. And when you told me the truth about me and my actions, I got pissed off. I was given, I didn't choose, but I was given by my loved one, Titi, a topic of God's inspiration or intuitive thought or an intuitive thought. And uh, I kind of smiled because it's a great topic for me because I'm a no, no God baby. So uh, let me take you back just a little bit so you can understand in my life what the intuitiveness and the God inspiration means. I'm gonna take you back to where I started just a little bit before I met you. I was running around the streets of Spanish Harlem in New York, decided to uh, California for a brighter day. Um, I'll take you further back than that, quickly. In my childhood, I have four sisters, no brothers, so it was always a girl's way around my house. I had two loving parents who raised me and were always together while I was still there. Uh, we were very poor, but we had a lot of love in our life. Didn't have money, didn't have things, didn't have stuff. But all the kids on the block would always hang out at the cruiser's house because as soon as you get out the elevator, you can smell the food, you can hear the music. The big guys and girls were drinking and we were dancing ever since I was five years old. My first traumatic experience was at five years old. My security blanket was always my grandmother. Whenever I didn't get from my mother and father, I'd go to my grandmother. And she'd always console me if she couldn't give it to me. The longest day of my life was the walk. I had to go to kindergarten, and I was used to being home with my grandmother. And we took this walk. She said, come on, little poppy, let's go. Come on, little poppy. I said, Grandma, I don't want to go to school. And I was crying like a little baby that I was. I'm mostly undeveloped. I didn't want to go. And it was a long walk to that bus stop, and I kept pulling on the dress saying, I don't want to go, I don't want to go, mommy, I don't want to go. And she got me there. When I got there, she said, I'll be here when you come back. I looked on the bus, and all these kids were in there laughing and playing and having fun. And I got on the bus, and they had in their eyes, what you had in your eyes when you met me, that had that welcoming spirit. And they were welcoming me into the big fun. And I looked at him, and I gave him the look. And the look was, leave me alone, or I'll hurt you. And they left me alone. And I rode all the way to school, looking out that window. We got in school, all the kids were laughing and playing games and doing this. And we get in the classroom, and the teacher's talking. And the only thing I knew what to do was look out that window. I want to let you know that I looked out that window from that time in kindergarten, five years old, until I walked in Alcoholics Anonymous and met you. No matter where I was, how fine my clothes was, how fine my girl was, whatever kind of tennis I had, whatever I had, which was good, I always looked out the window for something else. And I lost a lot of good relationships because I always looked out the window. Once you were mine, I'm looking out the window. And I lived my, like that for a long time. The other uh, vibe I want to tell you about before we move on is that fear has been a fiber of my entire life. From the time my grandmother had me get on that bus until the time I met you. Fear was the fabric that I lived by. But the key was you guys told me about illusions and delusions. No one knew I was afraid of anything. And I was afraid of everything that moved. But if you ask anybody around me, they'll tell you, don't mess with that Boricua, he cut you. We didn't carry guns in those days. We carried uh, straight razors. And we'd slice a man up quick, fast, and in a hurry. But what they didn't know was I was afraid of everybody that moved. And the reason I carried that switchblade is so nobody would mess with me. I go to school, I'm looking out the window. I go to junior high school, I'm looking out the window but I get introduced to sports. I was pretty good at sports. I went to an all-boy high school purposely because I was a little intimidated by girls. 
Now I was raised with six women. And when it's raining and you pour and you live in the projects, each one of them have two women, two girls come over the house. So I got a house full of girls and don't know what to do, except get locked in my room. Don't want to be bothered. So I looked toward the street at a very early age. The things I saw in the street was the things that attracted me. A girl's way of life just wasn't that, that deal. But what I found out at 35 was, I'm glad I had those sisters. I learned a lot. I just didn't know I was being schooled as I was growing up. So I learned a lot about how to treat a woman, how to be with a woman and that kind of stuff. And I don't mean be with them physically, I mean emotionally and soulfully, how to you know, treat them well. So I get in high school, I'm an excellent basketball player, good football player, excellent swimmer. So I hide behind my sports. I'm not getting loaded yet, I'm a late bloomer. And this is in the days when they didn't even test you yet. UAs weren't even a the thing then. Guess I'm dating myself, Ralph, but it, they didn't, there was no testing then. You just do what you do. I was real popular in high school. We had an all girls school. I went to Diva Clinton High School in New York. We had an all girls school called Walton. And at 315, you see about 100 men running for the train because that was the booty train. And that's the train the girls got on. And trains in New York get real, real, real tight. And we tried to get real, real, real tight. And it was just fun and games. On the day of our prom, coming out of high school, I'm trying to fast forward so I can get to the God stuff. Getting out of high school, the girl that I was going to go to the prom with, she decided to dump me and go to the prom with my man. So you know me and my man got to get into a fight. And I love to fight. So we stopped fighting. I beat him down. And uh, I go about my business. This other guy says, hey, I heard what happened to you, man. Get a little sip of this. Now, I'm a junior in high school now. I'm, I'm ready to roll. And I take a little shot. I took that shot. And he went to reach for the bottle. I said, wait a minute. I took another shot. And that shot hit my tongue, burned my throat, bounced off in, in my stomach. And all of a sudden, I was six foot four, blonde hair, blue eyes, two ounces of body fat, fighter jet pilot. And here comes the walk. Now I'm not afraid of anything. And from that point till I met you, I was about liquid courage. That's the way it rolled. I couldn't dance without it. I couldn't sing without it. I couldn't talk without it. I couldn't think without it. Had to have that liquid crutch. And it served me well, because I'm a potty guy. Everybody comes to my house, we dance. You guys call it the salsa. We didn't call it the salsa. It was just a way of life for us. And we go to high school, we work, we get money. Uh, there was about five of us. They used to call us the Magnificent Five. We used to like to dress. You know, every time I come out that house, I look like I just came out of GQ. But it was all on the outside. I was looking like that because of what I wanted you to think about me, not because of who I was. And we fast forward, I go to school, I go to the university, I'm going to be a pre-med major, I'm going to flunk out, because it's the first time in my life that I'm around a lot, I mean a lot, of filthy, rich, white people. We didn't have that Spanish Harlem. And I get around them and I see what they're about, and they like me, and I go off, and about after a year and a half, I flunk out. So I flunk out of school. Shame to that, but it's no big thing. I get back in school again. But now my drinking has escalated. When I finally got to you, right before I get to you, I was up in Nevada, Las Vegas, smoked out, homeless, have been homeless for about two years, and I hadn't eaten in a long time. So I go behind this restaurant, and I know at 11 o'clock that door is going to open, and what's going to come out is the manager dumping the last of the cleanest dirty food into the dumpster. I am going to intercept that bag when I hear the sound. And I go to intercept that bag, and it bursts in my arms. And I felt that hot plastic, that hot fresh coffee, and all that old food on my arms. This is my first spiritual experience. I have an outer body experience because I'm crying. I haven't eaten for a week, and I'm looking at the food down in the dumpster. And I was tired of going down there getting it because that's where I was eating. And I look at that dumpster and I'm just crying like a baby. And all of a sudden I find myself up here and I'm looking down 
And I said, my God, what have I become? And fear ran through from the bottom of my feet to the balcony of my mind. I mean, it just ran through like a tornado. And I said, who is this at this dumpster? And the vision put so much fear in me, I just started running for about two miles, full speed ahead. And I ran for another seven years before I met you. When I came in, they thought I, uh, I had dreadlocks, long dreadlocks. I didn't have dreadlocks. My hair was matted. I had a baseball hat on for three years and never took it off. I wouldn't look at mirrors. I was about 99 pounds soaking wet. I was dodging raindrops. My skin was gray. Puerto Ricans don't have gray skin. My skin was gray. I had about 11 and a half teeth in my mouth. I, I did not look like a vision for you. And every time people would come near me, they'd run. I actually wasn't what they were running from until I smelled myself one day. I smelled like a vat of vodka coming out my paws every which way but right. And I didn't know it. And they didn't know I wanted to cross the street too. But when I did, I was still there. I finally got sick and tired of being sick and tired. I got to giving these guys a little bit of baseball bat therapy in this park, they call MacArthur Park. And I just started walking. I don't know if you're familiar with downtown Los Angeles, but I walked from downtown Los Angeles to Pasadena. I had heard about this homeless shelter where you can stay there for a couple of days. And I walk to this homeless shelter and I get in there. And I'm on this line. Now this line is two lines. The line is to get in there, but it's also they serve breakfast at that time. I'm standing on that line, spiritually, emotionally, financially, physically bankrupt. And I'm looking at these people on this line and my mind's telling me, look at these fools. They tore up. Look at that bum over there. Look at that, all that vomit on that guy's shoes. Look at that raggedy ass woman over there. And I'm just inventory, 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 and didn't know what it was inventory about until I realized after about 10 minutes, fool, you're on the same line as they are. What are you putting them down for? And then I had to live in that shame and that guilt and that remorse. I get in the homeless shelter and you're supposed to stay there maybe about a week. I stayed there 17 weeks. In order to keep your bed in this homeless shelter, you had to go to 7.30 meeting every day and they had this funny little blue book. You had to be there if you wanted your bed. In the afternoon, you had to go to this two o'clock writer's workshop, which was about topics in the blue book if you wanted to keep your bed. And at 95.30, you had to go to a participation meeting where I used to sit way in the back on death row so nobody would ever call me. I didn't want what you guys had it. This was my first introduction. All I wanted to do was stay there long enough to get me a GR check so I can get me a little couple of dollars and I can stop doubling my money until I come up. So I thought, God, that I didn't want to be bothered with in no way, shape or form, had a different idea for me, only I didn't know it. So I stay in this homeless shelter, people trying to be, uh, befriend me. I I'm a loner by nature. So I'm like, hands off. No, no, no. I'm okay. Hey, where you going? Where you going? Let me come. No, I don't want to come. Leave me alone. I just want to just be, because I'm still dealing with this falling from grace as I did for the last seven years of my life. We get to this place and I fall asleep, in the, uh, meaning that they had this little funny book in that they read every morning. I just fall asleep in there. Walk around Pasadena all day, come back go to the writer's workshop. Now the writer's workshop caught my attention because I'm a fairly good writer and I like to write. And uh, so I sort of excelled in there. But then they start wanting me to write about topics in the book. I wasn't into that book. I sat there about maybe seven weeks and one day I'm sitting there with my head down and for some strange reason, I hear this voice say, we of Alcoholics Anonymous, are 100 men and women who have recovered from a seemingly, seamlessly hopeless state of mind and body. Now, they probably read that every morning at 7.30. I don't know why on that particular morning, but I lifted my head up and they went on with the reading. The next day, I was waiting for them to get to that part. 
and I had a strange idea that maybe I might be able to get some help. I leave there. Only supposed to stay there two weeks. I stay 17. I'm a friendly guy. I got good social interpersonal skills. I'm of service. I'm doing all kinds of stuff around there. People think I'm staff. I'm not trying to uh, be staff and fate, but that's who I am. You know, I, I'm a sort of active guy. And uh, finally, it's time for me to go. Now, I have been faking because after two weeks, you're supposed to start calling treatment centers. And then when you get in one, you go. But I was telling them, no, they didn't have any beds. They didn't have any beds, they didn't have any beds. And finally they called me on it. And I got a bed at this uh, treatment center up in the mountains. My sponsor at the time said, you're gonna love this place. It's wide open, it's 137 acres and there's plenty of places around there for you to write. And I went to that place. I never knew where the gym was. I never knew where the TV was. I never knew where anything recreation was. All I knew was my bench, and my journal. And that's when I start thinking that maybe there is something to this God idea. But while I was in there, people would know, stay away from that guy. When it's time to pray, all I say was, I wish you this meeting hurry up and end. I don't want to pray, I don't want to do anything. I wasn't with the God thing. I'm a recovering Catholic, I had a lot of issues. When I was young, I was trying to be an altar boy, and then they did the mass in Latin, and I didn't learn Latin fast enough, and they'd beat you with those rulers on your knuckles until they bleed. So I didn't want to be bothered with any of that. So it wasn't about the God thing. You know, my gun was my God, my woman was my God, my jewelry was my God, my car was my God, my duplex was my God, everything out here was my God until I was stripped from it. And I wanted to tell you all that so you can see this Puerto Rican sleaze bag eating out of dumpsters day after day, night after night. Don't want to be bothered with anything about God. And little did I know that all this time that I didn't get shot, stabbed, and killed, there was a power hoovering over me that you introduced me to. So I came in here, I met you guys. I couldn't figure out what you wanted from me. But I also couldn't figure out how could they want something for you? You don't have anything. What could they possibly want from you? And you were being too friendly, too touchy, too lovely. So that's not, no, I mean, that's, no, that's not me. Let me just be. And, uh, I got a funny idea, I'm always getting funny ideas, that maybe I couldn't do this alone. All I wanted to do was get back, get my turbo saw back, get my clothes back, get my weight back, and go see my mother and my son. That never happened. I'm a single parent, never been married in my life, and I'm raising my son. I sent him off to the University of Utah, and when he went there, it was the first time in my life since I was 19 years old that I didn't have any responsibilities. And did I go crazy until I met you? So you got this no God baby comes up here and you guys say, just come to some meeting, work these steps. But I look at the steps and all I see is God, 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 God. I said, no, nah, I'm not with the God thing. By the grace of God, lucky for me, I met an old man back in the days when they stopped ashtrays and that's what they'd have you do. He said, Sonny, Sit down. Be quiet. Now, you know me. Man, my name ain't Sonny. My name is Rico Cruz, man. What are you talking about? You know who you're talking to? I ain't got pissed, pot to piss in, window to throw it out, and I'm talking back. I said, yeah, man, what you want? He said, don't worry about the God thing. Don't worry about it. You take these steps in the order that they're written in to the best of your ability, and maybe something will happen from you. And while he was saying that, all my mind heard was, why don't you try this? You don't, you don't want, you don't want, I know what's behind me. I don't know what's in front of me. Fear kicks in, but the fear of what's behind me is greater and I try it. And I start taking to these steps and had little problems with two. He said, don't worry about that. You believe that I believe? I said, yeah, but I'm not with that. He said, that'll get us a start. Just believe that I believe. And we got to three. I said, man, you must be crazy. I'm going to turn my mind and my will over to somebody that I can't even see. He said, just stick with me. Just stick with me. Nice old man. And um, from that point on, I stopped believing that maybe something could happen for me. Some of that shame was starting to shut up. Some of that guilt, some of that abandoned fathership was, was coming out of me. 
and I take these steps. And I laughed when DT told me, uh, this is your topic. I said, it's funny. And I'm going to talk about God inspiration and intuitive thought. And I am the one that never, ever wanted to be bothered with God again. They called me no, the no God baby. No heckling, no God baby. They, they used to tease me about it. It didn't bother me because it was true. But I went up to this treatment center. And I wrote, and I wrote, and I wrote. And I went to this 6.30 in the morning attitude adjustment meeting every morning like clockwork. Because by that time, I had been in a shelter 17 weeks. And to keep my bed, I had to go to meetings. So I was kind of used to going to meetings. But I didn't think this was going to work for me. I think I'd go in the treatment center, get myself together, go back down to Pasadena, and start doing whatever it is I do. I had another plan. While in that treatment center, one of the staff members had relapsed. And I said, what are we going to do? And my counselor at the time was a woman. She said, don't talk to anybody. I got one of my clients I want you to meet. And that led into a student working job and a job. And eventually, I wound up being the director of the joint, the administrator of the joint. But that's neither here nor there. The part that got me is before I got out of there, I started getting interested in this God idea. Because everybody in the meetings was talking about this God idea. Today, as we sit here, the most important thing in my life, bar none, is God, prayer, and meditation. I didn't do that. You men and women, Alcoholics Anonymous, those steps, those concepts, those principles, put me in this little bag, shook me up, and another man came out. And that's the man you're talking to now. That be me. How I got from no God, don't want to be bothered with God, defiant about God, and anybody that was involved in God, I'd cap my hand up. No, 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 no. Could sit here today on a mystical journey that I didn't know I was on and have God inspire me to do some other things that I've gone on to do and still do. God inspiration from a Puerto Rican sleeves bag eaten out of a dumpster that don't want to be bothered with God. I've cursed God. And still the love came to, but the love came through you one day at a time. So I took these steps, four through nine, and I cleared my path. And it became a little more reasonable. I got to six and seven and found out that I really want to let go. Because everything I let go on has claw marks on it. I'm not a quick let go guy. I hold on. I go down with the Titanic. I get through that. Now I'm ready. I got my little list made out. I'm ready to do my amends. My first few amends were all right. One of my big amends was to an ex-girlfriend. Didn't go that well. It wasn't great. But what happened was I found out what amends was about. So I can't talk to you about God, so I talk to you about amends, because I didn't know that all this work was to put me in a place where I could talk to God. Clear my path. Clear my path. I didn't know that. But when it happened, I'm in eight, and I'm in nine, and I'm coming out of nine, and they're talking about, we now enter the spirit. What? Yeah, we entered the world of spirit. Who entered the world of the spirit? That ain't my thing. But we got a lot more to do. Then you guys made me uh, do a meditation and prayer at night, try to write all my wrongs on paper. I'm saying, what are you guys doing to me? I don't want to be a trapeze monk. I just don't want to be drunk. When I came in, I wanted to find somewhere I can sit down and not get arrested. That's all I wanted. And that's how I got to that homeless shelter. They wouldn't come in and arrest anybody. I get to that place at eight, nine, and I start feeling better. I finish my amends. I'm on top of the world. So I think. Little did I know, I've just done some of the grunt work. Now it's time to take some action. Now it's time to help somebody else. Now it's time to know you can't transmit something you haven't got. I didn't know this deal was about unconditional love. I read about it. You told me about it. 
but that applied to you. I'm king agnostic. That don't apply to me. God's going to work in your life. Either. But what I've done, that only him and I know about? Nah, he's not working for me. But you showed me. Just keep moving. Just keep moving. I'm coming out of nine, going to the 10, and you're talking about every morning when I get up, have this little conversation. Ask for some guidance for what it is you would have me do today. Now, I've been a power player. I've been in charge of a lot. I'm an active leader. And I'm going to ask it. I'm used to people coming to ask me what to do. Now, I got to ask this God guy what to do. Yes, you do. I try it. Now, you know, fear is my fiber. So I still carry it a little bit with me. I start doing it. Something starts to happen. I start feeling lighter, more loving. Shame is starting to shed a little bit. I could look you in the eye, because the only time I look you in the eye is if your eyes are on that street. Everything I did, I look down. I'm looking people in the eye, and they're telling me, I told you this was going to happen. Well, I didn't believe you. Now it's taking place. Now we're going to another level. Now I got God in my life. My sponsor made me every night write down those questions in step 10 and give it to him the next day to make sure I did it. So in the beginning, I was just writing it like homework. Like, yeah, here's my homework. And I, I was being honest and truthful to the best of my ability, and I give it to him. But after a while, it was no longer an assignment. I wanted to be able to look at my day constructively and see what I needed to do. Was I selfish, self-seeking? Where was I wrong? Did I harm anybody? Or any, oh, anybody apology? Was I just taken out of life because I'm a taker? Was I given anything into life? And I started looking like that. And for the first time in my life, I was not afraid. I looked at the truth about me with the best of my ability at that time. And I got into prayer meditation. When I was a student in college before graduate school, I had joined uh, Transcendental Meditation. So I knew a little bit about meditation, but I joined Transcendental Meditation because I had a pretty Japanese girl and she wanted to go to Transcendental Meditation. I went too. My mother didn't raise no fool. You go, I'm gone. But my heart wasn't in it. It's not that it didn't work, it didn't work for me because I didn't let it work. But when I got through 10, and I got to 11. And I asked him, well, why do I need to do this at night and do this in the morning? And he told me, you want a clean slate when you get up. Clean slate. You go to bed angry, there's a good possibility you may not wake up in joy. You go to sleep mad, it's a good possibility that you might not be in a good mood when you wake in the morning. So I'm listening, but I'm seeing some uh, results. I got to keep traveling this road. Now we get here. And we're doing this prayer and meditation thing. At first, I couldn't do no meditation thing. I was told, just sit still and be quiet. Don't worry about the noise. And then they told me, whatever thoughts come in your head, just don't attach to them. Just let them fly, just like the wind. Just let them fly. And over time, I started liking it. I said, oh, I can work with this. The most difficult thing I had to do was move myself out the way. My sponsor always tell me, shrink, Rico, grow God. Shrink, Rico, grow God. I got it. And I do that every day. Not because I'm some great guy, because I want to be free every day. I have a sign over my bed that says, always kiss me goodnight. It's not for Lynn to kiss me goodnight. It's for me to kiss God goodnight every night. Because when I was 16 years old, my sisters used to line up. I used to be the last one. And we'd line up to kiss my mother and father goodnight. We've been doing that since we had our eyes open. And when I was 16, my sisters went, and then they go upstairs, go to bed. I went to kiss my father goodnight. He put his hand up. Men don't kiss. That was such a dagger in my heart. I said, what do you mean? You're my father. Men don't kiss. I guess he was trying to make me a man based on what he knew. And I had a dagger in my heart until about my third resentment. Because I've been kissing my father goodnight since I could breathe. 
and all of a sudden I can't kiss you goodnight. Man, no kiss. Not to help it. Puerto Rican girls are kind of rough sometimes. My sisters would tease me. You can't kiss daddy. You can't kiss daddy. Ah, ah. And it used to drive me crazy. I used to want to choke him, but I knew I couldn't. And I carried that all the way, that resentment to my third inventory to let go of that. Or who I wanted my father to be. I loved my father. I kissed him all my life. Well, I can't kiss you now. I'm the same son. You're the same father. And I carried it with me. You people taught me how to give that to God. And not give it to God and take it back. Just give it to God and leave it alone. Go do something else. And by this time, my fear is diminishing. I'm starting to see some results. Don't worry. I didn't have no burn marks on the bottom of my feet from walking on water. No, it wasn't like that. But I just became another member. And it felt good. Not bigger, not smaller. Just another member. I fell in love with step uh, 11. Everybody tells me all my life, no step is better than the other. Well, that might be. I fell in love with 11 because it helped me with freedom one day at a time. So when you talk about God inspiration, my first God inspiration was at a dumpster, crying like a dog, like an animal. He showed me a little montage and let me see it. And I never saw it again until I met you and have been with you for a while. God inspiration is all I have today. All I have. Not because I'm some great church going, read the Bible, quote the Quran, read the Torah. No, I'm not that guy. I'm just an ordinary Joe. I come from below ordinary means, trying to do some extraordinary things with some extraordinary beings. And those extraordinary beings are the many women that I met in these rooms in Alcoholics Anonymous over the past few years. That's what fries my chicken, and I don't even eat meat. It just puts the butter on the bread, and I love you. And there's nothing you can do about it. You took me to a place, taking me to a place where it's not important what you think about me. It's important what I think about you. That, this is a no God baby. Now God is my vision. I try to see you through him. That's my God inspiration. I had a guy that I was in a treatment that was a racist, straight out racist, never hit it. And my mentor at the time, Dr. Richie Rio, said, I got an assignment for you. Because he knew I liked to write. So I'm thinking it's going to be a writing assignment. He says, I want you to find the God within him. I said, are you crazy? He said, no. OK. So I'm looking every day. It took me 11 months. And I saw a little piece of pipe. And I got so excited, I ran in there. I said, Dr. Real, Dr. Real, I got to talk to you. I got to talk to you. He said, slow down, Rico Sign, slow down. I said, no, I got to talk to you now. Close the door. I said, Doc, guess what happened? He says, what? I said, I saw it. I saw it. He said, you saw what? I saw the little light. I saw the guy within him. He said, sit down, Rico Sutter. He said, you didn't find the guy within him. You found the guy within you. And I froze. I said, what? He said, you can't see what's not in you. And from that point on, my life took off with the God thing. Couldn't believe it. And I don't walk on water. God inspiration is asking God, let me see this differently for things I don't like. Let me see through your eyes, because I'm not seeing right. And I've done it long enough that now I trust God vision. That's what inspires me, God vision. What would God do in this situation? Ralph just busted me upside my head. What would God do in this situation? He would love him. He would treat him with love. From a no God baby to where I am now, I've come here sincerely, only to be truly helpful. I'm here representing he who sent me. I can go anywhere. It don't matter what I need to say or what I need to do. 
because he who sent me will direct me. That is a God-inspired journey from the dumpster to where you and men, you men and women have taken me. And I never, ever, ever take any credit because I know it was you. I would hate to think what my life would be like today if I never met you. And you talk about the topic intuitive thought. That means with no effort, no resistance, easy come, natural insight. I never had that. My intuitive thought's always been, I'm going to get you before you get me. And I come in here and these people, ladies, steps up from these concepts, these principles, and now I have intuitive thought. And you told me I can have it if you want. There's a few simple things I have to do. And I did them. God inspiration is all I have. Because if you get Rico inspiration, we're going to all be loaded. That's not going to work. I got a track record for that. But my God inspiration comes out in action when I know there's a guy that can't stand me. Can I put love on the table? I'm talking to Ali, Teresa, Reggie. Brown, Fernando, I'm talking to them. I'm always putting love on the table. I don't care what they say. How about that guy that can't stand me? Can I put love on the table? I cannot without being God inspired. I was up at a convention years ago, and this big penitentiary guy comes up to me. Hey, you're a rough looking guy. You Rico Cruz. I said, I was yesterday. Why? He said, you remember me? I said, I've seen thousands of people. He said, you remember you was teaching the Big Book class up in Warm Springs, and you said only three people would be clean and sober next year. And I told you I was going to be one of them. And you said, maybe. I had a resentment for a year about that. But I found everything you told me was true. And he started crying. And he started hugging me. He said, I'm taking a seven-year cake tonight. Would you give it to me? And then we both was crying. Because of what you men and women have taught me to rely on God, who has all power. And I do that today, and I make a lot of mistakes. But God inspired when Teresa asked me about God, God's inspiration, I went, yo? <laughs> because she knows about my no God experiences. I said, that's a long journey. Intuitive thought, never have a problem I do anything my intuitive thought is, I sit and I be quiet. I finally learned how to sit and be quiet. I've been a big mouth all my life. I sit and be quiet. I have a problem for a second with Lynn. She said, I'll be right back. And I go back to my little office and I just sit and be quiet. And I listen for the truth. And you know what I got to do when I come out of that? I got to go in the kitchen and say, I'm sorry. I was wrong. I'll try not to let that happen again. Because I can listen to the spirit of the voice that I need to listen to. I need to listen to he or she who is called by many names. I don't care what you call it, but do call it. God inspiration is what happens here in Alcoholics Anonymous with you men and women. I have no monopoly on this. I received the gift from you and the gift of God. The same power that I didn't want to be bothered with was the power I had to plug into. My problem was lack of power and you told me my solution was power. How do I get to this power? And you showed me how to get to this power. I can drink and use and go on to the bitter end, or I can accept these spiritual help. And I make that decision and I move on the floor and I go for a ride. Not kicking and screaming for the first time in my life because I am so desperate. I met you and the window opportunity and the window desperation intersected. And what came out of my mouth was yes, I don't know how to live. I'm 40 years old and I don't know how to live. I know how to take some stuff. I know how to have some stuff. 
I know how to keep some stuff. But I was living in another world. And I don't know why, but I lived in a world that I built up this image so that you would think I was somebody that I wasn't. I always tell people, it's better to be hated for who you are than it is to be loved for who you are not. And I have spent the first half of my whole life being loved for who I was not outside of sports, because I was that. But outside of that, whether it's rocket scientist, teacher's aide, professor's assistant, whatever it was, I was doing it because of what I wanted you to think about me, because I didn't think about enough about me. And you showed me a way where I could take these steps, get in touch with a power that I didn't want to be bothered with in any way, shape, or form, and maybe get some answers. And I found that to be true. So to stand here before you, an ex-dumpster diver, an ex sleaze bag, and ask to talk a little bit about God inspiration, my life is God inspired. And I didn't make it like that. You did. By showing me how to live. And I thank you for that. Intuitive thought. That's all I think about. Intuitive thought. That means I can do things easily, not too much effort, don't put too much on it, just relax and the answers will come. The thing about being raised in the Western world is they got all these commercials and things and stuff and everything's out here. No one says, Rico, go within my son. All the answers you need are there. I never looked inside in my life unless I was looking to see if I was cut or shot. Yet I meet you, you take me through this work and you say, sit and be quiet. The answers come. From you, I believe you. For you, I believe you. But I had to have my own experience. I believe two things have to happen for us while we're here. One of them is you have to find your own truth. Mine might get you lucky. And you have to have your own experience. I can't take your experience and live on a spiritual plane. I have to have mine. And you've been loving enough and kind enough to allow me to have my own experience, whether I was beating my head against the wall or going in the wrong direction or not. You never closed the door on me. I always tell guys I work with, always keep the God window open. No matter what it looks like, all he needs is a little space. Keep the God window open. And it works. You people are part of my God inspiration. You people in Alcoholics Anonymous are part of my intuitive thought. I can do intuitive thought on an intellectual cognitive plane, but you guys told me I got to do it on a spiritual plane. How is a no God baby going to come in here and be on a spiritual plane? Because when I hear spiritual, I hear religious. I hear religion, I'm gone. I hear God, I'm gone. And you said, stick around. Don't leave today. And one day at a time, from that day to this, some things have happened in my life. Being God inspired. So when I got a little taste of it, I wanted more. There was a time in my life about 15 years ago, I had never been in Hawaii in my life. And I told my sponsor, I said, sponsor, I want to go to Hawaii. I've never been there just to celebrate a milestone. It was another milestone for me coming up in sobriety. And he said, man, you deserve to go. You've been of service since you've been 17 days sober. You've been of service, man, go ahead. But I had guilt about it because it was a time where the economy was real down. And a lot of people were asking me for work and asking me to do this, to help with this. I said, man, how can I go to Hawaii and all this stuff is going on? He said, you deserve it. You've never treated yourself to anything yet. Go to Hawaii. And I went to Hawaii, not, is there something? not to hang out, excuse me, not to hang out. I went to Hawaii, I wanted to go on a silent retreat. I like hanging around with monks up at the monastery. That's what I learned to do. And I went to Maui and I went to this place was the perfect setup. And it was a retreat house, only they weren't having a retreat that weekend. And I went for five days on a silent retreat. 
no TV, no radio, no books. And it took me 24 hours to get the noise out of my head. But when that noise left me, did we go for a ride? And I met what I needed to meet. I found out that I was okay inside. I found out it's not what you think about me or what I want you to think about me. I found out whether there's a hurricane, COVID-19 pandemic, marriage, divorce, separation, job, unemployment, no matter what's going on in my life, you taught me that there's a place I can go inside that there's always peace. And that is where I found my God inspiration. So whenever something is really on me, I know it's the ego voice. So you got the spirit voice and the ego voice. Ego voice talks loud. Hey, hey, can't you hear me do this? No, don't do that. Don't let them do that to you. Spirit voice is quiet. Spirit voice says, it's probably not a good idea. But I can't hear him because I'm listening to the loud ego voice. I learned to listen to that spirit voice and I get God inspired. I get God inspired to love you, not because you're handsome or pretty or who you are, because of who he is. Because he could have left me at that dumpster. I sit still and get quiet and I get those intuitive thoughts. So now I get those intuitive thoughts before I go out my door. I need to be in fit spiritual condition. And you men and women taught me how to do that and what to do to be there. The book talks about every day I have to carry out the vision of God and his will be done, not mine. There's a prayer I say every time before I go out the door so I can go out like that. So if I run into a hurricane, and if you live in Los Angeles, you will, it doesn't throw you off track. Because I don't do when I'm off track, I don't do well. I respond, and I respond hard. I do much better loving and being God inspired. I had an intuitive thought before I came on here. I sat quiet and I came in here. And I said, I need to tell my Titi, I love you. I love you. Because she represents that to me. I don't care what's going on in her life. I don't see that. I see the God within me. And when the God within me talks to the God within you, we don't have no problem. It's pure, pure, unadulterated love. But when my ego talks to your ego and my false pride talks to your false pride, we have problems, big problems, because that's not the way it's supposed to be. If you in the middle of the herd of Alcoholics Anonymous, you are God inspired. Whether you tapped into that resource or not, I can't tell you. I'm not the one to judge. You told me you couldn't tell if I was an alcoholic. I had to diagnose myself. And you took me through that book. And when I was in the doctor's opinion, it was clear as day. I thought I was a rotten, low down, dirty son of a you know what. Because my, the University of Utah came down here to recruit my son. He played football. I'm a single parent. I'm at the office party, Christmas party. This was back, this is when stories first came out. So you know, I'm dating myself. I couldn't get that stories and that powder cocaine out of my hand. And every 15 minutes he called me, he said, he's at the airport. I said, I'm on my way. I'm on my way. I'm on my way. And I got home at 8.30 that night. And my son looked at me. If eyes could kill, I'd be a dead man. And rather than respond in shame and own it, I responded with anger. I said, you ever look at me like that again, I'll kill you. I brought you in this world, I'll take you out. Don't you ever look at me again like that. And when I got an inventory and amends, I had to make that amends to him, I was crying. How could I ever talk to the guy I brought into this world that I love more than life itself? How could I talk to him like that? My mother, before she died, had an experience with me. She said, I don't know who you are, but my son ain't here no more. I don't know who you are, mister. And she left. And I get on my phone. And I assist in Puerto Rico. I call her. I call my friend in San Francisco. I call my other sister in Hempstead, New York. 
And I got the crying drunk. I know you know your mother said to me. But you guys took me to the doctor's opinion, found out I was sick and didn't know I was sick. That I had a threefold disease that you guys helped me treat. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And you got me out of that dumpster to this God inspired life. And I'll tell you over again, I don't walk on water. My name ain't Saint Rico, but I try and do the best that I can. And as I do, those intuitive thoughts come in. I never had intuition before, unless I was gonna jack you, stick you up, or take your stuff. I was intuitive. No question, no pregunta. But uh, man, what a ride. So let me at least get to 12, I'm coming out of 11. So I get in 12 and you guys tell me, haven't had a spiritual awakening, not as a result of you being a great guy, you're an asshole. We had a, haven't had a spiritual awakening as a result of these first 11 steps that you took. As a result of that, you can carry the message to the alcoholic who still suffers, if you choose. God has done for me, I got to do for somebody else. What God gave me was a life through you. My gift to God is to be kind and loving to you. If no one told you they love you today, I got a God that loves you, so do I, and thank you for letting me share.